me invite you to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 10. Doing a series of lessons we call The Authority of the Believer, or if you're under 30, it's called Zombie Killers. And it doesn't have anything to do with my message, but I thought I'd throw it in, so there we go. It's talking about the authority that we have in Jesus. This is part five of this series. You know, the Bible says in 1 John 5, 19, that the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. In other words, the enemy, the devil, if you know what we're talking about, still has control over this world system. People say, well, God's in control. It doesn't take a genius to just think through, get out of our religious minds a little bit, because I think one of the best things you can do is unhook from religion and get into the Bible. Religion tells us God's in control of everything. If God is in control of everything, then we've got babies being born crippled that apparently God wanted to have happen. We've got a drug-addicted people that apparently God wanted to have happen. We've got um, two towers in New York City that apparently God wanted to have down, and so he couldn't figure out a way to get them down, so he did it with 3,000 people dying with airplanes. And we, if we just think things through a little bit, we realize that there's evil in the world, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one or the authority of the wicked one. But Jesus died on the cross, d defeated the devil, grabbed that authority back, delegated it to you and I, and now we have to walk in that authority, and the time is running out for the devil. There's going to be a, his lease on the earth is running out. Jesus will come back someday. New heaven and new earth. Jesus will come back someday. But the reality is right now, faith is a fight. We have to fight in everything that we do. And so today, we want to talk to you about, and maybe over the next few weeks, is what rightfully belongs to us, what rightfully belongs to us, with the covenant that we have in Jesus. In Luke chapter 10, verse 17, it says, Then they 70 return with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus said to them, or he said to them, I saw Satan fall as lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you power or authority to trample on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Every promise of God that we have in the Bible is appropriated by faith. I want you to turn. This is going to be one of those Sundays where we're just going to let the word speak for itself. I do this a couple times a year. In 1 John chapter 5, everything that we have is appropriated by faith. In other words, we must learn how to walk in faith to appropriate the promises of God. The promises of God do not come upon us just because we're a Christian, just because we're born again, just because we say we love God. The promises of God do not automatically come upon us. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 says, Whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. So faith overcomes the world system, the way that things are done, the, 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 the craziness out there. Have you, have you noticed that the world is crazy out there? Have you noticed that? We've got guys trying to bomb people all the time. We've got people running into buildings with airplanes. We got religious people that think God wants them to kill people in the name of their religion. We've got, I mean, it's crazy out there. The world's crazy out there. We got taxi cabs trying to run over you in New York City. <laughs> you know, uh, we, we, uh, we were in, we got, grabbed a taxi cab from the airport. And we, the first guy we, we got, uh, we, we uh, got in the car. And I said, how you doing? And he said, I'm blessed. I said, well, are you a Christian? He said, yes. He said, I'm a Christian. I said, well, that's great. He, he, I, said, I said, are you born again? I said, yes. He said, I'm born again. And I didn't want to tell him I'm a pastor, but it came out eventually. And, and the whole thing he had to argue with me the whole time, I mean, he just argued with me the whole time. It was like a 30, 40-minute drive. And all he wanted to do was tell you why women shouldn't be preaching in front of people. And Joyce Meyer was of the devil. And I'm like, I'm like it was the most grueling taxi ride I've ever had in my life. I, 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 I started swapping scriptures with them, and then I just realized you can't, you can't deal with a fool. Religion is taught, and I, and I said, well, sir, I said, I said, I probably studied the Bible more about grace than I do judgment. And I said, I guess God will forgive Joyce Meyer for getting all those people saved and filled with the Spirit. So, I, but, but only religious spirits can think like that. Only religious spirits can think like that. 
If you, 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 you know, his church he goes to is 15 people, I'll tell you something. 15 people. And only religious people can think like that. Let's unhook from a religious, weird spirit, and let's just stick with what the Bible says. We serve a loving God who wants to give us things and bless us. Amen? Amen. Now, all right, with that in mind, so it, the whole world lies in the sway of the wicked one. Now, so what belongs to us under this covenant that Jesus had? What belongs to us here on earth? Well, basically, the, the things that belong to us are threefold. Basically, we are redeemed because of Jesus. We are redeemed personally from poverty, sickness, and death. And when I say death, I'm not talking about death in the sense of dying, because when the Bible talks about death, most of the time people look at the word death as what we know death is, I went to a funeral, that's death. But the Bible death is just the death, the, the negative things that life portrays on our, 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 our dishes out to us. Or separation from God. Remember when he told Adam in Genesis, he said, on the day you eat of that fruit, you shall surely die. Well, he didn't die physically, he died spiritually. So he's talking about the death that he's talking about is a death of spiritual death, and that which causes physical death, but we're redeemed from spiritual death. So poverty, sickness, and second death or spiritual death. So we're going to pick up each one of these. We're going to talk about the healing power of God today, and then we're going to pray for the sick at the end of the service today. Because I want you to see your covenant right is for that you to be well. It's important for you to see that. Now, and so it's important that we realize that the Word of God, Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. I want you to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 9, and verse 35. And I want you to see how Jesus dealt with unbelief. Jesus dealt with unbelief this way, Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Jesus, whenever he encountered unbelief, we think that Jesus just went around a lot of times. We think that he just kind of just cruised from place to place. Like, you know, one day he'd like get this whim to say, I'm going to wash sugar this week. Uh, I'm going to go wash sugar today. And, and then we're going to take a journey to Camas, and then we're going to we'll go to Vancouver, and then we're going to hit Portland the next week. Now, I believe when he went someplace, he spent some time there, and ministered some things. So Matthew chapter 9 and verse uh, 35 says that Jesus went about all the cities and villages, notice this, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. So he went teaching, preaching, and healing. Teaching, preaching, and healing. If we don't have teaching, we won't have preaching, and we won't have healing. So how do you overcome unbelief? You overcome unbelief by teaching. And so and unbelief, doesn't mean we're, unbelief doesn't mean that we're, um, that we're bad people. It doesn't mean that we're evil people. It doesn't mean we're stupid people. It just means that unbelief has crept in somehow into our life. So Jesus combated uh, combated uh, people's unbelief by teaching. And you find that in Mark chapter 6, where he went into his own town, and he could dare do no mighty works. And it says then, right after that, it says, I believe it's the sixth verse, he said, he said in Mark chapter 6, I believe it's 1 through 6, and I think it's the sixth verse, he says, he says, and Jesus went about in the villages in a circuit teaching. Why? Because teaching overcomes unbelief. So this morning, we're going to teach this morning, we're going to talk about what rightfully belongs to us. Do you ever think about this? When Jesus was teaching, did you ever ask this question? I just, I didn't think about it, but I just all of a sudden asked this question. What did he teach? I mean, what did he teach? Well, we know that Jesus, from even at age 12, was an incredible uh, student, uh, studious of, he was studious of the Bible, of the Old Testament. He knew the Bible. He could, he could hold his own with the Pharisees at age 12. He could hold his own with the Pharisees then we don't have any real uh, recollection of what happened to him for 18 more years. We call them the 18 silent years. But I'll guarantee you, his patterns of studying the Bible, if at 12 years old, were incredible that he could hold his own with the Pharisees, then I guarantee you those patterns didn't stop. For 18 more years, he's studying the Bible to know the Bible, the Old Testament. Probably knew the Old Testament like the back of his hand. Maybe be able to quote the whole thing. I don't know if he could quote the whole thing. But we have 18 more years. He was already great at 12. But at 30, he was amazing. So what did he teach? Well, apparently, he would be teaching from the Old Testament. So he went into the Bible and found out things. And from my uh, recollection of things, 
Jesus went into the Old Testament, found scriptures about himself and different things, and then he began to proclaim those, and he proclaimed and acted as though those scriptures were true. So I want to do some things today. I want to go Old Testament, New Testament, just kind of go into some of these things. And what did Jesus teach? Let's look into it. Look at Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53 is a prophetic um, utterance of Jesus coming back. It talks about him, you know, there's so many Old Testament prophetic words about Jesus. And Isaiah 53 was one of those prophetic words about Jesus. And Jesus quotes Isaiah 53 in Matthew 8, 17, and Peter quotes it in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. So a lot of ways the Bible was canonized, if you will. The canonization of the Bible just means what books, but the canonization of the Bible just means what books ended up in the Bible. How did they end up in the Bible? Can, the canonization of Scripture. Why? Because there's many other books that didn't end up there. There's a lot of books, and the Catholic Bible has a few more, and, and a few other Bibles have a few more. But what, what did they do to canonize? Well, one of the ways that they canonized the Bible or found out what, what, what belongs in the Old Testament, what belongs in the New Testament, is they would see quotes from Jesus from the Old Testament. So if he's quoting Isaiah, they knew that Isaiah was good. And if he's quoting, and if Isaiah's you know, basically mentioned in, in Matthew, then that was part of the canoniz canonization of Scripture. So here is a prophetic utterance about Jesus and it gives, and this is a couple thousand years before Jesus died or was born, and it says in Isaiah 53 and verse 3, it says, and this is speaking about Jesus and the law of double references, is he's despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows. Now, in my Bible, the word sorrows here, there's a little two next to my Bible. How many of yours has that, uh, some, some Bible like that that has some kind of a thing that indicates there's a, Greek, a different meaning to that? So in my Bible, there's a little two, which I go over the column and I find out what the, it's not Greek, but the, the Hebrew meaning of that is. And so the word sorrows there is literally translated pains. So I'm gonna, and I'm going to share with you all these words that are translated different. It said a man of pains, acquainted with grief, or that word grief there is actually sickness in the Hebrew. We did hide, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised. We did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs, or sicknesses, and carried our sorrows, or pains. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded. The word wounded there means pierced through, or pierced through. We know the sword was pierced through his side. Pierced through. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon it, and by his stripes, the word stripes there means the blows that cut in, we were healed. So then Matthew 8, 17 says that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, it says, himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. 1 Peter 2, 24 says, by his stripes we are healed. So you have the Old Testament confirming the New Testament and here's telling us that Jesus, there's a Messiah coming that's going to bore our sicknesses and pains. Now you're going to find that with all the teaching out there about God putting, on, putting sickness on people, God putting diseases and God allowing this and God allowing that, apparently you're going to find from Jesus' ministry that Jesus didn't know anything about that. Isn't it interesting that Jesus didn't know anything about God putting any kind of sickness on people? Jesus didn't know anything about any kind of sicknesses being on people at all. He didn't know anything about that. He just ministered to all that came to him. So I'm just trying to bring, bring some faith in this room to a place where when we lay hands upon you in a little bit, I believe you're going to be healed. Look at Psalms 103. Psalms 103. Just a, I just have work to do today. Just some work to do. I want to get some people healed today. Got some work to do today. Verse 1 says, Bless... Bless the Lord, O my soul. Remember, Jesus is reading this Old Testament. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Well, what are they? Who forgives all your iniquities? Aren't you glad he does? Thanks, three people. Glad you. Who heals all your diseases? How many of your diseases? All. Do you know what all means in the Greek? All. You know what it means in the Hebrew? You're exactly right. You guys are Greek and Hebrew scholars. He heals all your diseases, redeems your life from destruction. Doesn't matter if your life's going down the tube. Jesus can redeem your life from destruction. 
crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. I don't know about you, but I'm 53 years old and I'm feeling younger all the time. I feel, I feel better at 53 than I did at 33. I'm just, I'm just get renewed all the time. Someday this body's going to wear out and I'm going to pass away, but I'm going to be going for it. Every, I'm going to be going for it strong because there's something about these scriptures, if we believe these scriptures, and he says who heal, forgives all your iniquities and heals all your diseases. So Jesus is reading this one day, and I believe he just expounded on that and teaches this and teach people how that God wants to heal them. So he just was probably over here in this. I can just see Jesus on the hillside just quoting some of these Old Testament scriptures who uh, you know, himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. That's me, guys. That's who I'm talking about here. Then here he says, guess what? Did you know the word says in Psalm 103? He says, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. And I believe he's out there teaching 5,000 people, and he's telling them that God wants to heal them and deliver them. I'm here to tell you, Faith Center Church, God wants to heal you and deliver your life from destruction. We serve a good God. Amen? Amen. So let's, uh, let's see what else did he teach. Let's look. Look at some other things here. Look at, uh, look at Psalms 107. You're right there in 103. Turn to 107. Can you just see Jesus looking through the scrolls in, uh, at the temple of the Old Testament? And he knows these by heart. And he'd go to scriptures like this. And he says, verse 20 says, He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Man, this is good stuff, isn't it? I'm just bringing faith. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. What else did he teach? Well, let's look at some of this. In, in, in Matthew chapter 15, you don't have to turn over there, but Matthew chapter 15, verse 26, Jesus calls healing the children's bread. He says, healing is the children's bread. Look at Proverbs chapter 4. Psalms, Proverbs, Matthew, Mark. Yeah, I, some of you got that. Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 20 says this, My son... Give attention to my words. Have you ever told your kids that? See, I, I, if, you, if you look at this, it wasn't just, I, I don't think he was just talking about my son, give attention to my words. Sometimes I remember when Joel was young that, um, that sometimes he'd be zoned out on the television. And if I'd call him and he wouldn't respond to me immediately, I'd turn off the television because I want him to respond to me immediately. And sometimes we had to lift our voices up and say, Hey, son, give attention to my words. It's time to go. It's time to clean your room. It's time to listen. Well, I think that's what he's trying to tell us here. Give attention to my words. Give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. On Sunday mornings, if you feel like it. No, he says, don't let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. For their life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. The word health there literally is medicine to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Their health to all your flesh. So Jesus is over there reading. The, I can see him up there teaching 5,000 people. And he goes over to Proverbs, and he looks at Proverbs, and he says, he says, the, the word of God is health to all your flesh. And he's, I can see him just teaching. I'm just speculating here. I don't know whether he did or not. But I assume he knew the Old Testament, the same scriptures I do. So I'm sure he's up there talking and teaching people. Hey, the word of God is health to all your flesh. That's why it's important. And I can see him up there teaching why it's so important to get into the word of God, to meditate the word daily. Speak the word, meditate the word. No. Years ago, I told you the story how... how um, Therese and I turned our financial situation around because we just got into the Word and we meditated the Word. And, and I heard this still, small voice in me. And I kept asking him, I said, Lord, what's, i, I got to have an answer to this financial thing because, you know, we just can't do the ministry you want us to do with the finances we have, and da 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 and, and this still, small voice kept saying this to me. He'd say this. He'd say, your answer's in the Word. Remember that story? Your answer's in the Word. Well, now listen to me, what he's saying to me now. I'm hearing him almost daily say this. I'm saying, Lord, okay, well, I need some answers because I have this great vision, and, I, and, and I, you get this, you've given me this vision to do this thing on television and take this word throughout the Willamette Valley and, you know, from Eugene to Kelso and take this out there and everywhere. And I said, well, you know, man, we're having trouble sometimes making payroll. I said, there's got to be something different. And here's the voice he's saying to me now. Speak the word. Speak the word. 
That's what he's telling me. Speak the word. Speak the word. Joshua 1 8 says, This book shall not depart out of your mouth. Speak the word. Speak the word. Speak the word. So Jesus knew these scriptures, and I'm sure he was in there looking at some of these scriptures and just meditating on some of these scriptures and teaching people. Apparently, Jesus didn't know that God put sickness on people because he healed all that came to him, every single person. Now, let's look at a couple of scriptures about what is the nature of Jesus. What, if, what is the nature of, of Jesus? Now, John chapter 14, I'll just quote this one. Jesus said unto him, this is verse 9, 11, 9 through 11. He said, Jesus said to him, have, ha, have I been with you so long, yet you have not known me, Philip. He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me. The words that I speak to you, I do not speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me. He does the works, or does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. So Jesus said, if you want to see the Father, look at me. If you want to see how the Father acts and what his heart is, look at me. Let's read one more scripture along that lines. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. It says this, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he's appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the expressed image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he made himself purge our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, becoming so much better than the angels, he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So in the Old Testament, he says, I spoke to you the Old Testament, I spoke to everybody through the prophets in the Old Testament, but now all you have to do is look at the sun and you'll see how I am. So let's look at the ministry of Jesus. Let's look at the healing ministry of Jesus just a little bit. I'm just, I'm just reading the word. I'm just maybe adding a little bit of things inside some of these things, and then we're going to pray for the sick in just a few seconds here. But let's just read the word. What does the word say? Watch this. Look at Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit with power, who went about doing good and healing all, all, how, how much is all in the Greek? Okay, so every single person that Jesus ministered to, every healing that he did, which was probably thousands and thousands and thousands, without one exception, because of the word all means all. When you say, are all of you coming, then that means if you say, if I, tell Seth, if I say, Seth and Kate, is all your family coming? If one of them wasn't coming, they'd say, oh, one of, Ellie's not coming. For some reason. They'd say one of them's not coming. They would tell me one of them's not coming. But if, it's like, if all of them are coming, they'd say, yes, we're all coming. That means all of them are coming. So, who went about doing good and healing all, apparently all of the people Jesus ministered to, were oppressed by the devil, for God was with them. Every single person that Jesus ministered to was oppressed by the devil. God didn't put sickness on any one of those people. The devil put sickness on those people. God, all who were oppressed of the devil. So apparently every single person, I'm, I'm building faith. Can you feel faith building in this room? Faith is beginning to build in this room. Every single person that Jesus ministered to was oppressed of the devil. Now, it's interesting, Hebrews 7.25, I don't have it on my notes, says this. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and October of 2012. Forever, that includes that date. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if Jesus wanted to heal all that came to him, healed everybody that was oppressed to the devil 2,000 years ago, he wants to heal everybody in this room today. Everybody. All who were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. Matthew chapter 8. Just a few more. When he came down, verse 1, from the mountain, great multitudes followed him, and behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus put out his, and touched his hand, saying, uh, I see that you had a fight with your wife tonight, so I, I, you go home and make that right, and we'll get that right after that. No, he just said this. So then Jesus put forth his hand, touched him, saying, I am willing to be cleansed, and immediately his leprosy was cleansed. 
One translation says this. I believe it's the New English Version says this. He says, uh, the lepers came to him and says, if it's your pleasure, you can make me clean. Jesus turns to him and says, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. Didn't ask what they did the night before, Saturday night. Didn't ask if they messed up with their boyfriend. Didn't ask if they messed up with their girlfriend. Didn't ask if they paid their tithe. Didn't ask if they were right with the Jewish calendar and laws. Didn't ask anything. Just immediately he turned to him and he said, look, it doesn't matter what your situation is. Doesn't matter. He didn't care about all that stuff. He just knew that he had the healing power of God and God healed him right then. Bam, the power of God hit him and the leprosy was cleansed from that very hour. And it was not only his will, it was his pleasure to heal him. It was his pleasure to heal him. Look at uh, Luke chapter 13. We'll read 10 through 13 and then verse 16. Now watch this, this verse will blow your mind. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. Oh Lord, don't do that on the Sabbath. So we can't, now wait a minute, I, I, to, to properly do this in a religious manner, I can't pray for the sick today. You come back tomorrow because this is Sunday and we can't do, oh wait a minute, no, okay, whatever. But that's the kind of people they were. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years. You ever, you ever feel like there's a spirit of infirmity upon families sometimes? It just seems like just constantly there's some, something going on in a family. It, just, it gets in a family. It's just like their family's just sick all the time. I believe it's a spirit of infirmity that gets in a family sometimes. It says, uh, behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and then could no wise raise herself up. So here she's walking around like this. You ever seen people like this? I, in the Philippines, I see people like this. She's walking around like this, and she, she's a Jewish woman, and she's walking around like this. Can you imagine that for 18 years? Doing this for 18 years? Walking around like this? I have trouble doing that. You'd have pretty good back by that time. Your back would be in shape, because you're, you're, I mean, you can imagine just for 18 years, walking around, probably had a cane, and, hey, Sonny, how are you, you know? Walked around for 18 years. Now look what happens here. He called it a spirit of infirmity. And it says, uh, but when Jesus saw her, he called her, him, or called her to him and said to her, woman, you are loose from your infirmity. And as he laid hands on her, immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Skip down to verse 16. So ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham, in other words, he's talking about she has had a covenant right to not be bent over for 18 years, whom Satan has bound. There's another one, Satan is bound. Think of it, for 18 years, be loose from the bond on the Sabbath. They, they got ticked off then because he healed on the Sabbath. Jesus was not a, a religious man, he was a Bible man. I mean, he followed the religious traditions and things like that, but he was not going to sit there and say, I'm sorry, you, you, we can't do this for you today. We'll come back on, on Monday, or come back on Sunday, because Sabbath was Saturday back then. Come back on S Sunday, and we'll take care of this. People get so religiously bound up that they forget that God just wants to heal people. And he said that this woman being a daughter of Abraham, in other words, she had the right, listen to me guys, she had the right of healing for 18 years, but she didn't know how to appropriate it because we appropriate everything by faith. She had the right to, for healing for all 18 years, but was not healed. She had a spirit of infirmity. Matthew 14, 14 says this. Last scripture, and then we'll commission you. And when Jesus went out and he saw a great multitude, he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. Now, people say that Jesus healed to establish who he was, in, you know, that tried to establish who he was. Well, I don't dispute that, and we need that. But the first priority of healing in Jesus' ministry was because he didn't want to see hurting people. He wanted them well. Sometimes, it, it, this always never ceases to amaze me, and I hear this almost every time, that someone says this, they'll say, um, you know, God will heal somebody and they're, they're on their deathbed and God will heal somebody and they'll say this, they'll say, well, I guess I have a lot more to do. Indicating that somehow, if you don't have a lot more to do, God won't heal you. And I always think about this, I think about, see, my loving God will heal you whether you sit around and eat bonbons all the rest of your life. He'll still heal you because he loves you. It's not because you have something to do now, you better get busy and do it, 
But it's not because you have something to do. It's because he loves you and doesn't want to see you in pain. Because we serve a loving, wonderful God. Are, are you getting this? So yeah, you have more to do, but that's not the reason why you got healed. You got healed because Jesus has compassion on you. But there is this now, and I'm going to conclude it with this, that we have a great commission in Mark chapter 16. Go lay hands upon the sick and they'll recover. One of the reasons why God wants to lay hands upon people is he wants you going into your office space and seeing somebody that's bound by sickness and you go lay hands upon them and watch them recover. Why? Because then try to keep them out of church when you get them healed, their, their grandma healed of cancer. Try to keep them out of church when their, their baby's sick and you pray for them and God heals them instantly. God instantly takes care of them and prays for them. The other day, I, you guys don't know this, and I, I, don't, want, I don't know why I'm, I wasn't going to share this, but I, I just feel impressed to share this, but God loves our people. God loves people. The other day, just a couple weeks ago, I had a dream, and, um, and, I, and I know this just because God loves the people of our church. God loves people of our church. And I had a dream, and I saw, uh, I saw this car. I, I saw this car um, roll off a bank and, and hit a tree, and it just happened to be Jay and Annalise's car, Jay, Jay and Annalise's red car. And I saw it, their red car, and I know that their red car was in the shop getting the transmission worked on, so it couldn't have been that. And so I, I woke up, and, and, and this was 5.15 in the morning, I woke up and I was coming to the church to pray. Did you know the church is open for prayer now? Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 6 to 8.30 every day, from 6 to 8.30 of those three days. And I came, I, I had this dream, and so usually on Tuesdays, I, I, it's a family day, and I pray for family. And so at 5.15, I was leaving the house to come to the church, and I said, well, I'm just going to pray in the Spirit for 45 minutes over, because I, I saw that accident happen, and, and I saw somebody get a, a busted ankle, and I saw, I, we got done, and the, the accident was real serious, and I went, wow, it's amazing, only somebody, just a minor injury, somebody only got their ankle busted. And uh, it's just like, the, this could have been a death thing. I mean, it's like the way this rolled off this hillside. This could have been a death thing. And wow, just a little bit of thing. This just happened a couple of weeks ago. And so I, I prayed in the spirit for 45 minutes. And I just said, well, praise the Lord. So I prayed, and, and then the church opened. I was here at the church. I prayed all the way in and prayed for 45 minutes. And that day, Sheila Brevard got in a car accident, and Jason Peach was in the car. And if they would have been one second, a half a second faster or slower, that car would have just totally wiped them out, took out their car, but there would have been major injuries of that. Now, why does God have the pastor of the church have a dream to pray for and those kind of things? Why does he do that? Well, Sheila's got a, Sheila has an amazing, Jason has an amazing future and all that kind of stuff, but the reality is right, why he does this is because God's in love with Jason and Sheila. God's in love with them. God cares about you. God loves you. God wants to save you. God wants to, I'll tell you so many times I think God's speaking to us and saying, don't do that. Don't get involved in that relationship. Well, God's trying to ruin my fun. No, God's trying to get you out of a bad relationship. All right? It seems fun for the time. Or God will say to you, don't do this, and you, and you do it anyway, and say, well, why did the Lord happen to me? Why did this happen? Well, because he told you 18 times not to do that. Why does he tell you 18 times not to do that? He's not trying to ruin your fun. He's trying to ruin your evil in your life. 